Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. We're very thrilled today to welcome Taylor Conroy talking to us about his social enterprise, Change Heroes. Like many great things in life, this came out of an inspiration from travel, and the, the goal is to really connect people to make an impact with uh, organizations and, and charities worldwide. And so Taylor will be uh, talking a little bit about this, and we'll have time for some questions as well. So please join me in welcoming him to Google. Thanks, guys. Um, you know, I want to start by telling you my absolute favorite story, which happened a couple years ago. I got a call from a friend of mine, her name's Christina, and she's a grade one teacher. And she called me up and she said, Taylor, I really love what you're doing with helping build schools in, on the African continent. I want to do something really innovative with my kids this year for charity. I don't want them just doing like, the same old asking for money. I want to really teach them something. I said, great idea. Well, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm really passionate about teaching kids how to be entrepreneurs, more, more notably social entrepreneurs. I said, why don't we do this? We'll go to your class, six-year-olds. We'll go to your, you'll go to your class, and we'll give them $100 in seed money. And we'll say, you can have this $100, and that'll be your seed money. Your goal is to turn that $100 into $500 by starting your own little social venture. She said, I love the idea, went and told all of her fellow teachers, and in total they had about 18 teachers from that school in Western Canada um, all do this thing that we started calling the Early Entrepreneurs Experiment. And I'll never for walk, forget walking into the school with this like wad of $100 bills, which I thought would be a good idea. So I walk in with this, and I walk into this class, Christina, or the great, actually I walked into a grade two class first, so you got a picture of like 25 seven-year-olds all sitting cross-legged, and I walk in super jacked up, I'm like, you guys, I've got $100, what are you gonna do with it? They start freaking out, like, I'm gonna touch it! And the teacher says, whoa, whoa, Taylor, you can't just walk into a room full of seven-year-olds waving around $100. She's like, sit down, we have, a, you know, we have a flip chart. So she gives me one of those chairs. Remember in grade two, like the little squat chairs? So she gives me this little squat chair. I'm sitting in it, and she opens this flip chart. And in perfect kind of teacher cursive, it has the, the normal kind of business that you would start when you're seven years old, like bake sale, lemonade stand. And then down at the bottom, in this like squiggly seven-year-old writing, it says, Dylan's Plays and Stories. So I zone in on this in my squat chair, and I, and I say to the group, I said, hey, who's Dylan, and what are these plays and stories? They sound really interesting. And there's this kid. He's sitting. So you got to picture all these seven-year-olds. He's sitting separated from the, group, from the group. He's like the cool kid. He's sitting like this, and he says, ugh, that's me. <laughs> like he's, he's too cool. And, and I said, Dylan, tell us about these plays and stories. They sound really, really great. And so he stands up. And he goes, well, well, first of all, he's wearing like skinny jeans and a Led Zeppelin t-shirt. He's like a seven-year-old hipster. And so he, he starts pacing like this. And he says, well, I've written a number of plays and stories. They've all been very successful. He's seven years old. And I've written a play for all of the kids to perform. The kids are like, yeah. And we're going we're gonna to put on a play night. We'll charge our parents admission. We'll probably have the money raised in a night. And they did. Dylan's, Dylan wrote a play for the kids, his fellow classmates. They put on a play night. They charged their parents to come watch them. Could you imagine that? Like two little seven-year-old bouncers being like, what's your name? I'm your mother. And they, then they hawked you know, Coca-Cola and pizza and upsold them. And they did. They turned their $100 into $500. And the school did really well. Actually, the, the goal of the school was they had 18 classes. So we gave $1,800 out in total. And if they all hit their goal of turning it into $500, it'd be $9,000, which would be enough for a schoolhouse for kids just like them living on the other side of the world in Kenya. So the goal was a school to build a school. So I went back to the school about two months later, and, and they had this big kind of um, assembly in the auditorium to show me you know, what, how much they've raised. And they have like this big check, you know the publisher's clearinghouse checks, the big cardboard checks like under a curtain. And I get there, and the goal again is $9,000. I'm hoping that they've done it, because I'm thinking, how empowering would it be for these kids to learn that you know, business is a tool for doing social good? And they unveil this massive check, and the check is made up for $18,000. So in two months, these kids turned $1,800 of seed money into $18,000 by starting their own little ventures. And what I love the most about that, especially namely from Dylan, is that these kids, Dylan in particular, achieved a level of happiness that a lot of us adults are striving for. And if you look at positive psychology, it's called a meaningful life, which is when you're doing what you love, you're good at it, and you're doing both of those things in the service of other people. So Dylan, at the age of seven years old, achieved you know, a meaningful life. And I hope that he's still doing it till today. 
And myself, I was a little bit slower on the uptake than figuring that out at the age of seven. Um, but my search for a meaningful life started when I was 18. And I went traveling for the first time. I graduated high school, vowed that I would never go back to an academic edu edu or, um, institution. Went traveling all over the world, had an amazing time, fell in love with the new culture and the new foods and meeting new people. It was amazing. But there's only so long that you can travel you know, eating spaghetti with no sauce because you can't afford it and sleeping on bunk beds and hostels. So I got home, went home to Western Canada, um, got a job as a firefighter. And firefighting was amazing. Yeah, it's super fun running into, into burning buildings and it's exciting and hanging off ladders that are 80 feet high and using the jaws of life. But the thing that I love the most about firefighting is that my job was to help people. Like every day, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom it. My job is to go from one call to the next, helping person after person. And I knew that that had to be an intrinsic part of my life forever. So by the age of you know, 23, I realized that these two things are really gonna contribute towards my own personal happiness and meaning, which is travel and, and making an impact in the world. But being a firefighter, you don't make that much money being a firefighter. And so I realized that I didn't actually even have enough money to do the thing that I really loved, which was travel. So I decided, as the extremist I am, to swing totally in the other direction of focusing completely on money, on generating cash so that I can have the freedom, that I can get the medical and um, dental work and the, eat healthy food and not look at the price on a menu and have the things, the freedom that comes with, with having money and ideally being able to travel. And so I got into real estate and within about a year, I was making half a million dollars a year, 10 times as much as I'd ever made at the fire hall. And it was great, but I was working 100 hours a week I had no time to travel, and I was completely gone from like my heart and soul, which I learned at firefighting, which was actually making an impact in the world and being of service. So I decided to try to kind of combine a couple of these things. And I decided to go on a trip. I went on a trip for a year, went all over the world, about 17 countries, and the most powerful experience that I had traveling, so again, I saved up the money from real estate, went traveling. The most powerful experience that I had was in Uganda and Kenya. And actually, wait, let me back up one second. I just want to say, like, as an anecdote, one thing that I did that I was a good effort at happiness that totally crashed and burned was this moment here. Um, that beefcake is me. But good pose, right? Strong. Um, that's my most muscular pose. And that's about five years ago, on a, or no, seven years ago now on a stage in front of 400, pe 400 people wearing a pair of bright blue man panties. And I don't know if you can see that tan from there, but that tan, you have to lather that thing on at like every two hours overnight, 12 a.m., 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m. to get it that dark. And obviously no one told me I was supposed to put it on my face too. Um, so yeah, that was just a, a total failed attempt at happiness. So it was right after this that I went on that trip to Uganda and Kenya. And those powerful, powerful moments from that trip and all the other countries was meeting this little girl who's about four years old, learning a lot about her, but most of all learning about what her life had in store. Realizing that she lacked a lot of things. She lacked clean drinking water. She lacked adequate medical attention. And most of all, what hit me the most is that she lacked access to a quality education. So coming home from this trip, you know, still striving after meaning, still striving after happiness, trying to combine impact with travel and making money, but them all being completely separate and being an extremist in each area, I got home and decided that I was going to focus on the impact because that was making me the most happy and I wanted to raise enough money to build a schoolhouse for girls like this. And when I got back, I mean, you guys are all very busy people. Everyone on the live stream, very busy Googlers. I wasn't a Googler, but I was in real estate, so I was very busy. And I didn't want to spend you know, six months putting on golf tournaments and, and doing all of the typical kind of fundraising initiatives. I wanted to get the fundraising done. It was going to cost $10,000 to build the schoolhouse. And I wanted to get it done ideally in a day. So I hacked together this little equation, which is 33 people giving $3.33 a day for three months adds up to $10,000. So a friend of mine and I put together this little website. Um, I filmed a bunch of videos, so my video for Cliff, our lovely host, would say, hey Cliff, we're going to build a school um, in Kenya, and this is an example. So, hey Cliff, I'm going to build a school in Kenya with you. All you need to do is watch this video. It'll tell you everything to know. This animated video would pop up saying that it's gonna, the school is going to educate hundreds of kids, that you're going to get a Facebook cover photo to show how charitable you are, that you're going to get a tax receipt. It said that $3.33 is like a cup of coffee or a slice of pizza or parking downtown for two hours. It says less than the tip that you leave at a restaurant. And if you do it, your mom's going to be really proud of you. So I sent this out to my friends. 
they all gave, and in a day, we raised $10,000 to build a school for children just like the ones that I had met um, on my travels. And my mind was blown. Um, and I thought, I wonder, if other, I wonder if other people could do this too. You know when you, like, you do something and it feels amazing, or you read a really good book and you just want to share it with everyone that you know so that they feel like that too? This made me feel better than I had ever felt in my life. And so I wanted other people to feel like it as well. So I had friends of mine try it, it worked for them, they raised $10,000, and it just kind of spiraled into this tech company that we called Change Heroes. Mm -hmm. And it ended up funding about 150 schools, um, 400 projects in total all over the world, including water projects and libraries and anti-sex trafficking work, girls scholarships, homeless, homelessness initiatives, veterans rehabilitation um, for about 200,000 people. But what was crazy about it is that we had, after having 16,000 people give to these, give their $3.33 a day for three months, the number one thing that they asked for, the number one thing that they wanted was to travel to go and see the school, to go and see the house, to go and see the water project and actually see and touch and feel the impact that they were making in the world. And that was a huge moment for me. It was the first time I realized that the things that I had spent years trying to learn what would make me happy were the two things that a lot of other people were looking for most. So, oh yeah, and, and this, this impact, also thinking about this impact and travel kind of combination, I realized that by looking at a, a number of different nonprofits that the founders all had a very, very similar story. So the people that are impacting and, and helping the most people in our world, a lot of times they're founders of nonprofits. And if you look at their stories, like John Wood from Room to Read, or Craig Kielberger from Free the Children, or Scott Harrison from Charity Water, their stories are all very similar. I was working at such and such a place in New York or San Francisco or LA or wherever it might be. I went on this trip. I had this amazing moment. I was changed and I came back and I quit my job and I sold my house and I sold my car and I started this nonprofit and now we've impacted you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And I started thinking, well, if that's how impactful travel and service combined can be, wouldn't it be amazing if we, if we created an experience that would set off that type of a chain reaction and ideally set up an infrastructure on the back end that would make it negate the need for people having to quit their job and sell their car and sell their house because there's only so many people on earth that will do that. It's not scalable. We thought, what if we could remove all of the barriers to entry for someone to have an amazing experience like this and then do what Dylan did, which is putting together what he loved and what he's good at to be in service of others and live a meaningful life. So we started a company called Journey. And I'd love, if you guys bear with me for a second? Can we close our eyes for a second? I'm gonna take you through just what a journey feels like and, and tastes like, if you will. So I'll take you through a journey that we did last week. We got to Mexico City on Friday. So you land in Mexico City on Friday, meet up with 30 people from LA, New York, Toronto, Vancouver, all over. Everyone's just buzzing with excitement. Everyone's from totally different backgrounds, but what they share is that they're there to do something bigger than them. They're there on this trip in particular to build, build homes for families living in some conditions. So there's this common thread that bonds everyone immediately. So on a Friday night, we gather at the hotel, we walk to the historic, through the historic district of Mexico City, get to this 100-year-old restaurant that serves the most amazing, authentic Mexican cuisine, have a sip of tequila, but not too much, have quesadillas, have an amazing conversation, bed down for the night and get up early Saturday morning, head to the build site and meet, and picture this, meeting a Mexican family that is currently living in a shack made of tarps and pallets and cardboard or corrugated tin, whatever they could put together, meeting this family, this resilient, amazing, beautiful family, and then not only meeting them, but breaking bread with them. The food that you eat on the build is made for you by the family that's gonna be living in the home. Then swinging hammers next to this family, literally building them a home, likely, mostly, in most cases, the first brand new home they've ever had in their life. So build all day Saturday, bed down for the night, camping style Saturday night, and then Sunday doing the same thing. And because these homes are prefabricated, they literally go up in two days, which is mind blowing. It's like the Ikea of homes. So build all day Sunday, and the end of the day Sunday after working super hard and being focused on these homes, you can open your eyes now. We have what is my favorite moment on these trips, which is best shown by this picture. Those hands belong to a 95 year old man named Senor Rodriguez. Senor Rodriguez has never had a brand new home in his entire life been on the planet for almost a century. He's never been able to provide a brand new home for his kids or his grandkids. And those are his hands cutting the ribbon right before walking to his first brand new home. And to, and to share how not only, I mean, I was about 10 feet behind him 
crying my eyes out. Um, but to share how this feels for Senor Rodriguez, I think this picture does better than my words can. So these moments, this is what we are obsessed with creating on these trips is a moment where people are ideally you know, affected to, at a cellular level, where they're changed, and they start thinking about giving, they start thinking about contribution, and when they come back from one of these trips, they're changed, and they start living what maybe they would deem as a more meaningful life. And after this, after this lovely moment, we all get on a bus, we go to either the beach or we go to a retreat center and have time to integrate and have time to kind of sit with this experience. So on our trip to Mexico, we went to a retreat center called Hostel, Hostel de la Luz and we spent two days in Mayan sweat lodges and hiking these majestic mountains and doing yoga and having these like chakra therapy pools. Um, having group dinners, and on all of, our all of our trips, we teach all of our participants um, to meditate if they don't know how to meditate, because it's just such a beautiful way of kind of integrating these experiences and sitting in quiet with them. Because the whole goal is, that, is not just impact on the ground, that's obviously a huge part of it, but it's really, it's impacting the hearts and minds of the people that have a voice. And it's gonna sound, it might sound crass or insensitive, but the thing is, Senor Rodriguez, he doesn't have a voice because he lives where he lives. He was born where he was born. He doesn't have the ability to, you know, to, to reach the masses as fast and as easily as you know, us here in this room have. It's the privileged that have the voice. So the whole goal is to change the hearts and minds of the more privileged um, members of society so they, can, they come back and in, in a perfect world create an army of people that have had these moments that go out and you know, not only live a meaning, more meaningful life for them, but for all these other people that can be impacted as well. Now, after this, and this is where I'd love feedback after the talk, I would absolutely love it because you guys are actually a lot smarter than I am, um, is we started thinking, how can, this, how can this scale? How can this get to the point where it's, we're not just a travel company, you know, trying to take as many people on as many trips as humanly possible, because there's only fast, so fast you can scale with that. It's just not, the, it's not a Google type model. So we decided that we would go to countries throughout Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America partner with nonprofits on the ground that are making a tangible, sustainable difference and get costs as low as humanly possible at the hotel for accommodation, for transportation, and then pass those cost savings on to the people that refer people to come on our trips. So for example, we've got a guy named Eric who came, to, came with us to um, Nicaragua and to Mexico. And now Eric coming on his next trip, we're giving him $300 per person that comes with him. Does that make sense? So, so Eric, when he comes on his next trip, not only will, be he, will be he be traveling, helping to build a home, or a skate park, or a school, or a water project, whatever the project might be on that trip, but he'll be bringing people and actually making money to go on that trip. I know it's, some people think it's a sensitive topic of like doing good and making money at the same time, which I think is literally like the craziest thing. You can't combine doing good and making money, but we want to combine those things and are kind of obsessed with that idea. And so we pass those costs down, and, and it can spiral all the way to like Brandy, a yoga teacher um, from Vancouver, who's bringing 22 of her students on the next trip. So it can actually supplement the income, um, Brandy's income at the same time. So what I like about this, and again, I would love your feedback on that model and everything else that I've talked about today, is what I love about this is kind of come full circle in that my stumbling through and hacking my way through trying to find a feeling of meaning and, and living a meaningful life, which Dylan found out at the age of seven, um, has resulted in the ability to give other people these amazing experiences and hopefully enable them to live a more meaningful life as well. Thanks, guys. For the, yeah, so the question is, is basically an expansion on the topic of uh, making money and doing good at the same time. And that's more or less, right? Kind of comments on that. So yeah, you're right. Um, it's so interesting to look like, even if even this room, even very, very educated people on probably on the nonprofit and for-profit space, if you think, think to yourself, well, how much should the CEO of a nonprofit make? You know, I ask that, that question often, and a lot of people are like, hmm, 100 grand, tops, 100 grand. And it's like, you're, well, there's only so far an organization can get without amazing people. And the thing is, and then people will say, well, you know, I think that people should do it out of the goodness of their own heart. 
you know, but that's that's lovely. But a lot of times, like the best CEOs have like really big student loan payments that they have to make, and they have families as well. And so for them to make a hundred grand in a place where a hundred grand is, you know, like San Francisco, sure that's a, a a good salary. But comparatively to what they could make in the for-profit industry, it's you know an astronomical difference. And at the end of the day, we have bills to pay. And so myself, I guess I can use us as an example, or myself as, as an example, because that's the only th example that I have. Is our goal with with Journey is to create a two-sided marketplace for good. So where you have, you know, Airbnb, you've got travelers, you've got hosts. It's a win-win situation. Travelers are probably getting a little bit more affordable um, housing situation, accommodation on the other side. Hosts are making money on something that they wouldn't have made money on in the first place, and it's an, obviously it's the the largest accommodation provider in the world. It has more rooms than any other hotel chain or you know whatever it is. So. And that's because it's this win-win situation, whereas travel, in my mind, has always been potentially a win-win-lose situation. So it's a win in for the traveler has a nice experience. It's a win for the person on the ground who's facilitating the trip because they're getting the money. But there's also a lose. There's someone who's spending money and, and not getting it back, if that makes sense for the traveler. And what we wanted to do with, with Journey is make it so it's a win-win-win so that the traveler can go on the trip, the people on the ground can benefit like Senor Rodriguez and the people that are um, in the economy in the countries that we're visiting, and also a win where the traveler can actually make money going by bringing their friends at the same time. So that's our attempt at enabling people, to actually incentivizing people to do good, which is also even more like faux pas than, than saying you shouldn't make money while doing good. It's like incentivizing people to do good. Like you'll, does that make sense? So I guess that that's, that's my favorite topic, well, one of my favorite topics. And I think that social entrepreneurship, which is what we were kind of here to talk about today, is not just you know, halfway between nonprofit and for profit, I think it's an evolution of of both. It's an evolution. It's not even like on the same scale. It's using for profit um, traditional for profit models to make an impact in the world. And I think the more money that Journey or or companies like Journey or you know for benefit kind of corporations make, then obviously then the better it is for everyone. Question was how do we um, decide which project to support and which countries? Yeah, so we partner with nonprofits that have been around and are making sustainable, impactful, or proven sustainable, impactful results. So this one, for example, the home that was built for Senor Rodriguez was built or built by an organization called Techo. So Techo organizes the volunteers in country to help build the homes. They organize all the building supplies and materials, and they have a rating system which is out of a thousand on who is the, who is most in need for a home at the time. They factor in. Um, is there someone living with a disease in the home? How many kids are there? Is there one parent or are there two? Are they taking care of another relative? Are they sleeping on the floor? There's a lot of different uh, metrics that, that go involved in that system. And so Techo works within these communities for years, at least six months prior to a build, assesses the community's needs, which families are the most in need, and then determines who's going to get a home because of that. And they'll always have a fluctuating um, country which is, in the, which is at the most risk. So this this gentleman, Senor Rodriguez, he's from El Salvador. So El Salvador is, as you know, El Salvador is a very, um, it's a very dangerous place and it's a place in massive need right now. So El Salvador is very usually very high on Techo's list of the 22 countries that they work with of being the most in need. And so when we partnered with Techo, we said, you know, which countries are the most in need and those are the ones that we'll focus on first. So that's for home building and then for other initiatives like skate parks for at-risk youth or for water systems, it's always based on what the nonprofit's need is and with a community-driven approach. Yeah, oh yeah. So do we partner with tourism companies so that we can... Make travelers also have this experience. So that we can make travelers also have this experience. We, yes, yeah, I love that, thank you. We've just started. We've just started to, to partner with, the, the beginning we've partnered with other companies that are doing kind of imp impactful travel. Um, the goal is to have you know the brochures on every every travel agent's desk showing people that making it accessible. You know, and the price for a trip with with us is nine hundred and ninety dollars. You know, it's about it's less than half of a typical travel experience that has this much stuff incorporated. And that's the nice thing about um, to simply further to your question about making money while while doing good. The nice thing is you have this like bonus where you can go to the hotels and say, look, we're coming to this country to build you know, 26 homes in a weekend. And to do that, we need to keep costs really low. And so can you help us with that? Can you help us keep costs low? So we're working with uh, the Tourism Bureau of Costa Rica. 
Um, El Salvador, El Salvador has been super helpful. So when you're doing this, like it's almost the physical manifestation of the universe is on your side when you're doing good work, not to get too fluffy. I know we're very, we're all Googlers and very smart and intellectual, but if I get, I'm from Venice, California, so let's get fluffy for a second. Um, it's a beautiful thing where hotels offer to have lower rates so you can bring these more people there. Um, and yes, partnering with tourism, tourism companies is a, a brilliant way to go. The comment was, it's really hard to find, to go to a country and actually have meaningful, do meaningful work that doesn't cost $4,000 to sit at an orphanage and hold babies for a week and then leave. Thousands of dollars to do some of these. Yes, it's bananas, right? So anyways, and that's, that's what we found is, and we're all on the same page of startup life. That's what we found. We're like, wait a sec, there's, there's nothing available, especially for something affordable that's actually making a tangible impact. Like you leave one of these trips, you're leaving a home for a family that didn't have a home before. And so why I think that is, there's so many logistics involved. There's so many different parties involved with a trip like this. Like you're, you're trying to line up multiple hotels and tour operators, hoping that it's going to be safe because you're working in some of the most in need countries on earth. I mean, at, at one point, El Salvador is deemed the most dangerous country on earth to go to. And so traveling these countries, is, is, there's a lot of things involved with that, as well as um, working with a nonprofit, vetting a nonprofit. And then making sure that nonprofits, you know, doing good and solid work on the ground. A lot of these, a lot of like a trip. If you're trying to like put piece it together yourself, it's just kind of like a shot in the dark. Like hopefully it works out, right? Um, and that's I guess the nice thing from Change Heroes is we worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of different nonprofits and saw what their work on the ground was, um, and saw what the results that they were making were. So we kind of vet the nonprofits ourselves. Um, to, to go to go along with it. But congratulations on the 71 countries. The website is journey333.com and the next trips that we have coming up are, one is November where we're building, half the group is gonna be building homes, half the group is going to be helping to repopulate a shortage of sea turtle population. So we're buying nests now of sea turtles and they'll be hatching when we go on the trip. Um, so it's November, it's over Thanksgiving. And then we've got a trip in December which will be re refurbishing a school in Mexico. And then January, February, March is multiple trips. One's a skate park, one's homes, um, more home building. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And for, for people that have been that done that much traveling, we love to get involved with like co-leading. Because I mean, you've been, you've probably been to the countries that we're going to be going to. And so it's for us, and this is again for the feedback that I'd love, is empowering people to bring groups of their friends and help and get them to help facilitate the entire experience makes it a bit more intimate and cool. Thank you guys for having me. Much appreciated. And, uh, and my email is t at journey333.com. If you have any feedback or questions, I would love to hear it. t at journey333.com. Thanks.